to welcome everyone to The Beggar's Tomb, Episode 8. Today we're going to talk about Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie is a very important uh, part of The Beggar's Tomb. Front row stone. You know, Woody Guthrie, before there was such a thing as a hippie or a beatnik, there was Woody Guthrie. And when he traveled around this country, there wasn't a lot of people doing it to be cool, you know, it wasn't like it was part of a scene. It was, uh, Woody was sort of driven out of Oklahoma like many people from Oklahoma were by the Dust Bowl. Woody Guthrie is a hero. Uh, you won't, uh, uh, that's the first word that comes out of my mind thinking about Woody Guthrie because uh, there's a common conception that for every energy that comes into this world, there's an equal and opposite energy. And for Adolf Hitler, there was Woody Guthrie, in my opinion. He was the opposite of Adolf Hitler. He was, he fought for the ragged, the poor, whoever was the underdog and whoever was being bullied. That's who Woody Guthrie was for his whole life. And he could be called a hobo to a degree. Um, it's really hard to, you can't think of Woody Guthrie, uh, he's mainly known for the song, most known for the song, This Land Is Your Land. Most people learned it in school. It is a national anthem of sorts. Although it's not our official national anthem, it is a national anthem. And the Star Spangled Banner, as great of a song as it is, is basically a song to the flag at a time when the country was much smaller and it wasn't from one ocean to the next ocean so to a degree we needed that anthem that Woody wrote from the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream waters this land was made for you and me and he meant everybody whether the founding fathers did or not Woody Guthrie for darn sure did and he left plenty of proof in that. Now that's just one of the many, many songs that Woody Guthrie wrote. But what some people don't know is that during Woody Guthrie's lifetime, he didn't often, especially in early days, earn his bread and butter through music. He was a sign painter, and that's how he was able to travel around at first. Although he took his guitar and harmonica before he was able to make any income with it, he painted. And Woody Guthrie was a funny guy. He, uh, you talk about, he would have had a lot of memes. He would have come out with a lot of memes had the internet been around when, in his day because uh, something he said one time was, an artist is just someone who's been out of work for so long they've learned how to do something else. Now Woody Guthrie indeed was an artist, but he had to work also. And the sign painting he liked to paint pictures, but sign painting could be the lettering, and he had the paints and stuff, and he was good at it, and he liked to do it. So that's where he got was able to be travel around and knock on uh, business doors and see if they needed a sign painting. Well, to, before I don't jump into this, we're not going to uh, we're not going to listen to any of Woody's music because I don't know what of it's copyrighted or not. It's, maybe none of it is. The thing is that if it is, it's kind of ironic because before records, before the uh, poor, unsigned, not the world famous uh, musicians were selling records, um, people sold song books. And before Woody was able to sell records, he was able to sell a song books. And on the cover of one of his song books, he put this song, this, all songs in this book are 100% property of copyright by Woody Guthrie and anybody caught playing these songs, copying these songs, and teaching these songs to other people is a darn good friend of mine. So I really feel that uh, Woody would just want his, would want his music out there as much as it can be. Well, there's still a, there needs to be. I mean, he's an important part of American education, in my opinion. When you learn about uh, 
heroes in school, it's almost always a war hero for some reason or another. Now, Woody Guthrie actually was, is, could be seen as a war hero. Now, his guitar not only said, this machine stops fascist, and he taught people that the uh, fascist stance taken by Mussolini and Hitler was wrong here in America because it was spreading, sort of like a disease. And it takes uh, words of uh, logic, somebody talking sensible, to stop such a disease from spreading. And Woody Guthrie was that guy. Now, he didn't just do it with his guitar. He actually served in World War II in the Navy and uh, on, uh, overseas in Italy, actually. So, and he actually, before America committed to the war, he was already trying to, it's kind of interesting because you usually think of a protest song protesting to stop a war. Well, Woody was protesting us not getting involved in the war because he really wanted to stop Adolf Hitler. It was a mission of his. I mean, he wrote songs about it. So, anyhow, like I say, before we jump into this, we're going to get to know him through something else, through his literature. Because not only did he paint, and not only did he write songs and perform songs, but he also wrote a couple novels, and many letters to congressmen, all sorts of things that have become assembled now in other books. But this is Bound for Glory. This was his autobiography, and uh, some people believe his crowning literary achievement. It's a great book. Now, like I say, there's some, before we get into this, two amazing facts about Woody Guthrie that I find just really amazing. Fact number one is the Smithsonian has more items concerning Woody Guthrie than it does any, any other single human being. Now, that's really saying something. Of all the presidents, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, these uh, great heroes of the country, the founding people, well... <laughs> For whatever reason, they've collected more stuff about Woody Guthrie because that's how prolific he was. Now, second thing that's amazing, especially because it contrasts with that other statement so much, <clears throat> Woody spent the last years of his life in Brooklyn State Hospital. And a state hospital is a hospital for people that are too poor to pay a hospital bill. People who are requiring long-term care and they their family doesn't have the money to pay for it so and quite often state hospitals are mental patients well Woody was taken in by uh, police officers who found him wandering walking on the Jersey Turnpike now it really wasn't that uncommon for him to be doing that but the uh, busy highways it was and him getting to be older and uh, they said he appeared to be a little bit incoherent <laughs> they took him to Brooklyn State Hospital, and they called his family there, and they did an assessment. And when his family got there, they said, he's uh, he's got delusions of grandeur. And they're like, what? And he's like, well, he believes he wrote a book. And like, he, he did write a book. Well, anyhow, ironically, that's the book we're going to be reading from. <clears throat> First part I'm going to read is called Trouble Busting. A dad married a male widow wife. She came to Pampa from Los Angeles, and after two or three wedding celebrations, most of the relatives went on back to their farms, and Papa and his new wife, Betty Jane, settled down in a shack in tourist court. She put an ad in the paper and started telling fortunes. Her trade started out pretty slow at first, then it grew so fast that customers overflowed her shack. Oil field dying out, the boom chasers trickled out down the road in long strands of high-loaded cars. The dust crawled down the north and the banks and pushed the farmers off their land. The big flat fat lakes dried away and left hollow places across the plains full of this hard, dry, crackled gumbo mud. There isn't a healthier country than West Texas when it wants to be, but when the dust kept whistling that line blacker and more of it, there was plenty of everything sick and mad and mean and worried. People hunted for some kind of an answer. The banker didn't give it to him. The sheriff never told anybody the answer. The Chamber of Commerce was trying to make money, and they're too busy to tell people the answer for their troubles. 
So the people asked the preacher and still didn't learn that much about where to go and what to do. They even come to the door of the fortune teller. It was about, I was about 24 years old at this time and living in a worse shack than Betty Jane and Papa. It had cost me $25 on the payment plan a few months before. Oil workers didn't build mansions when they opened up a new boomtown. The work peters out, the workers bundled up and crippled off down the same old road that they hit town on. Their shacks are left, dirty, filthy, and all shot to pieces, and warped, and humped, and swaying in every direction like a herd of cattle with a plague. These little shacks lean around all over the plains. Your name Guthrie? A tough-looking man had just knocked so hard on my door that the whole old house almost fell down. I'm looking for Guthrie. Yes, sir, that's my name all right. I looked out the door. Come in. No, I won't come in. I've been spending most of my time for the last few months going around to people of your kind, trying to get some decent advice. He shook his head in the wind and preached at me like he was fixing to pass the plate. I ain't going to pay out another red cent. Four bits here, a dollar there, two bits yonder. It keeps me broke. Mighty bad shape to be in. I'll come in. I'll set myself down if... You can tell me what I want to know. You'll get 50 cents. If you don't, I won't give you a penny. And I'm worried. Come on in. Okay, sir, sit right there on this chair and listen. But I'm not going to tell you a single word why I'm here. You've got to tell me. Now, Mr. Trouble Buster, let me see you stretch your stuff. Dust is getting pretty bad out there. Start talking. You afraid of that dust? I'm not the least bit afraid of that dust. You must not have an outside job then. You're not no farmer. You ain't no oil field roused about. If you had a store of any kind, you'd be afraid of the dust because it'd be driving all your customers away. So, you know, mister, you got the wrong Guthrie. Keep talking. My dad married a fortune teller, but I never claimed to be one. But like, I'd like to see if I could tell you why you come here and what you want to know. There's four bits in it if you do. Well, you're an inside man. You work in an oil refinery. It's a good paying job, too. Right. How'd you know? Well, these farmers and ordinary working people around here, they got enough. They don't got enough money to be throwing around four bits here and a dollar there for a fortune teller. So your work is high class. You're mighty serious about your work. You really take pride in your machinery. You like to work. You like to see the most turned out in the shortest time. Always thinking about the inventing something new to make the machinery run better and faster. You tinker with it, and even when you're off the job at home. 75 cents. Keep talking. That new invention you've got is going to make you some money one of these days. There is a big concern already on your trail. Wanting to buy it. They'll try to steal it as cheap as they can. And don't trust nobody but your wife with the secret. She's out there waiting in the car. You got lots of faith in your own self and in her too, and that's mighty good. Keep on with your inventing and keep working all the time. You won't get what you want out of this big company you're inventing for, but you'll get enough to put you up in shape to where you can keep on inventing. Make it an even dollar. Go on. Your mind is full of inventions and the world full of folks that needs them. You just got to keep your mind all clear, like a farm. So more inventions can grow up there. The only way you can do that is to help out the poor folks all that you can. Here's a dollar. What's next? Well, that's it. Just think over what I told you and goodbye. You're the only fortune teller I've ever found that don't claim to tell nothing but yet tells everything. I don't claim to be no mind reader and I don't make no charge for just talking. You're just modest. I consider that dollar well spent, well spent, yes indeed, and I've got lots of friends all over these oil fields. I'll tell them all to come down here and talk to you. Good day. So there it was. I stood there looking at both sides of the dollar bill, the picture on the gray side, the big building on the green side, the first dollar I'd made in over a week. Just a man mixed up in his head. Smart guy, too. Hard worker. The gravels knocked splinters off the sides of the house, and the dust blew, and the wind come down. And in a couple days, that dollar was almost gone. Somebody knocked on my front door. I got up and said, Hello, to three ladies. Come in, ladies. Well, ain't got no money, and there's no time to waste neither. This lady was awful funny thing wrong with her. She can't talk, lost her voice. 
and she can't swallow any water. Hasn't had a drink of water in almost a week. We took her to several doctors. They don't know what to do about it. She's just starving. But ladies, I ain't no doctor. Some fortune tellers can heal things like this. It's the gift of the healing. There are seven gifts. The healing, the prophecy, faith, wisdom, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and the discerning of spirits. You've just got to help her, poor thing. She can't just die away. Well, sit down right here in this chair, I told the lady. Do you have faith that you can get cured? She smiled and choked trying to talk and nodded her head yes. Do you believe that your mind is boss of your whole body? She nodded yes at me again. You believe your mind is boss over your nerves, all your muscles, your back, your leg, your arms, your neck? She nodded her head again. I walked to the water bucket and took the dipper and poured a glass full. I handed it to her and said, Your husband wants you to talk to him, don't he? And your kids to boot. No two ways about it. You say you ain't got no money for a doctor. She shook her head no. You better quit this monkey business then and swig this water down. Now drink it. Drink it. Then tell me how good it was and how good it feels to be able to talk again. She held the glass in her fingers and I could see the skin was so dry it was wrinkling and cracking. She looked around and smiled at me and other two ladies. She turned the glass up and drunk the water down. We all held our mouths open and did a deep breath as we heard gloop, gloop. It's, it's what? Good. Water's good. You ladies going to go home now and spend the next three days looking after this lady. Get her lots of cool, clear drinking water and have a water drinking contest. Talk about everything. You don't owe me nothing. And so there ain't no telling where the wind will blow or what will come in the weeds. Was this the start? This was the start of one of the best, the worst, the funniest, and the saddest parts of my whole life. They thought I was a mind reader. I didn't claim I was a healer, but I never claimed to be different from you or anybody else. Does the truth help to heal when you hear it? Does a clear mind make a sick body well? Well, sometimes. Sometimes nervous spells cause people to be sick. And worries caused the nervous spells. Yes, and I could talk. Did that make them get well? Well, what are words anyway? If you tell a lie with words, you cause people all kinds of sickness. If you tell people the real truth, they get together and they get well. A little girl six years old had a big running sores all over her scalp. Her mama took her to the doctor and he treated her for over six months. The sores stayed still. The barber cut her hair off like a convict in a chain gang. The mother finally brought her over to my place and told me, just wanting to see if you can do anything. Do you keep her head good and clean, I asked the lady. Yeah, but she bawls and squalls and throws wall-eyed fits every time she has to go to school, her mom said. Don't mean kids make fun of me because my head looks like an old jailbird, the little girl told us. Take the white of an egg in a saucer, rub it in her head good overnight, let it soak all night. Then you can wash her head off with clear water in the morning before she goes off to school. You won't have to bring her back over here no more to see me. You'll have all the prettier head of hair than any of them old mean kids. How long will it take, the little girl asked. You'll have it by the end of the school year, I told her. That'd be nice, won't it? Her mom looked at both of us. But you, you quit your scaring this girl. You quit making her play by herself. Quit making her stay inside the house when all the other kids are out whooping and running, I told the mother. How do you know about this, she asked me. Quit making her wear that old dirty hat all the time, I kept on. Quit scrubbing her head with that old strong lye soap. Give it a little rest. It'll heal on its own accord. How come you're so smart, mister? The little girl laughed and took hold of my hand. My mama does everything just like you said. Shut your mouth. You're talking about your ma, you know. I knowed all of this because I can look at your mom's hands and tell that she makes her own lye soap. I know she keeps you in the house too much because you haven't been getting no sunshine on your head. And I know you have a big long set of pretty curls by the last day of the school year. So goodbye and come see me with your big curls. I watched the little girl skip 20 or 30 feet ahead as they went down the road towards the shack down. The little shack was just swaying in the dust one dark winter night and the man of 290 pounds banged at the door. 
and he brought the brother in with him. I don't know if you know it or not, he talked in a low, soft voice, but you're looking at an insane man. Off your coat, have a seat. Then I happened to notice that he wasn't wearing any coat, but several shirts, sweaters, ducking jumpers, and two or three pairs of overhauls. He more than filled north half of my little room. I'm really insane. He watched me like a hawk watching a chicken. I sat down in my chair and listened to him. Really? So am I, I told him. I've already been to the insane asylum twice. Well, you'll soon be running that place. I wasn't crazy when they sent me there, but they kept me shot for some kind of crap. Run me out of my wits. Made my nerves and muscles go wild. I beat up a couple guards out in the pea patch and I run off. Now I'm here. I reckon they'll get me pretty quick. I see newsreels in my head. Newsreels? Yes, I get started and I see them going all the time. It's like sitting around in a big dark movie theater. I see lots of them and I've seen them ever since I was a kid. Out on the farm, Mama always told me I was crazy. I guess I always was. Only trouble with these newsreels is they never stop. Oh, well, what's the news been lately? Everybody's going to leave this country. Boom is over. Wheat's blowing out. Dust storm's getting darker and darker. Everybody's running and shooting and killing. Everybody's fighting everybody else. These little old shacks like this, they're bad. They're no good for nobody. There's lots of kids sick, old folks. They won't need us working stiffs around this oil field. People will have to hit the road in all this bad, bad weather and everything like that. Ain't nothing wrong with your head. Do you think all of us ought to get together and do something about all this? I see stuff like this in the newsreels too, you know, the way everybody ought to. And you'd run for mayor around this town. I see all kinds of shapes and designs in my head too, all kinds you could ever think of. They bust into my head like a big flying snowstorm, and every one of those shapes means something. They mean how to fix a road better, or how to fix a hole in oil fields better, how to make work easier, and even how to build these big oil refineries. Hey, it wasn't said you're crazy. Officers, folks, they threw me in jail about a hundred times apiece. I'd have been just the other way around. No, I guess I needed it. I'm awful bad to drink and fight on the streets. Guys tease me and I light in and beat the hell out of them. Cops jump in on me and I throw them around. Always something haywire. You work all the time? No, work a few days and then lay off a few weeks. Always owing somebody something. I guess this town is just naturally drying up and blown away. You need some kind of steady work. Did you paint these pictures of Christ up here on the wall? He looked around the room and his eyes stayed on each picture for a long time. Son of Lark. Good one. I always did think maybe I'd like to paint some of this stuff I see in my head. I wish you could teach me a little of what you know. That'd be good kind of work for me. I could travel and paint pictures in saloons. I got up and rustled through an orange crate full of old paints and brushes and wrapped up a good bunch in an old shirt. Here, go paint. And so Heavy Chandler took the paints and went home. During the next month, he lost over 60 pounds. Every day he made a trip to my house. He carried a new picture painted on cardboard, plywood, boards of old apple crates, old hunks of scrap wood, and I was surprised to see how good he got. Wild blinding snow scenes, old cabins smoking in the hills, mountain rivers banging down through the green valleys, desert sands and dreary bones, cactus, tumbleweed drifting, rolling through life, good pictures. He bucked wind, rain, sleet, and terrible bad dust storms to get there. And every day I'd ask him if he'd been drunk, and he'd tell me either yes or no. He smiled out of his face and eyes one day and said, I've slept good all this week. The first solid sleep I've had in six years. The newsreels still run, but I know how to turn them off now when I want to. I feel just the same as the next one. Several hundred asked me where can I go get a job for work. Farmers heard about me and asked, is this dust the end of the world? Business people ask me. Everybody's on the move and I've lost everything I ever had. What will happen next? A boomtown dance hall chaser barged in on me and asked, I'm trying to learn how to play fiddle. Do you think I could be the next sheriff? All kinds of cars were parked around my little old shack. People lost, people sick, people wondering, people hungry, people wanting work, people trying to get together and do something. 
A bunch of 10, 20 oil field workers and farmers filled the whole room and stood around most of the front yard. The reader asked me, What do you think about this fellow Hitler and Mussolini? Are they out to kill all the Jews and niggers? I told him, Hitler and Mussolini is out to make a chain gang slave out of you, out of me, and out of everybody else, and kill everybody that gets in their road. Trying to make us hate each other on account of what the goddamn color our skin is. Bible says to love your neighbor. Don't say nothing about no any certain color. The bunch milled around talking and arguing, and the leader talked up and told me, this old world's in a bad condition, and it's coming to a mighty bad end. Well, maybe the old one is, I yelled at the whole bunch, but a new one is in the mail. The Spanish War is a sign, he kept raving on. This is the final battle. It's the Battle of Armageddon. This dust blowing in the thick, so thick you can breathe. Can't see the sky, the old scourge of the face of the earth. Men too greedy for land, and for money, and for the power to make slaves, of their fellow man, man has cursed the very land itself. Now you tell us something, Mr. Fortune Teller. Hell yes, that's what we come here for. Tell us a vision about all this stuff. I walked out through the door past five or six husky guys dressed in all kinds of work clothes, whittling, playing with warts on their hands, chewing tobacco, rolling smokes. Everybody in the room walked out in the yard. I stood there on an old rotten board step, and everybody hooted and laughed, and cracked some kind of a joke. And then somebody else said, Tell our fortune. I looked down at the ground and said, Well, sir, men, I ain't no fortune teller, no more than you are, but I'll tell you what I see in my own head. You can call it any name you like. Everybody stood as still as a bunch of mice. We all got to get together and find some way to build this country up, make all this here dust quit blowing. We got to find a job and put every single one of us to work, better houses, than these old shacks, better carbon black plants, better oil refineries, got to build up more oil fields, pipelines running from here, Plum to Pittsburgh, Chicago, New York, and gas for factories everywhere, got to keep an eye peeled on every single inch of this whole country to see that none of Hitler's goddamn stooges lay a single hand on him. How are we going to do all this? Just walk up to John D. and tell him we're ready to go to work? The whole bunch laughed and started milling around again. You ain't no prophet, one boy yelled. Hell, any of us could have said the same thing. You're a damn fake. And you're a goddamn fool, I hollered him. I told you I didn't claim to be nothing fancy. Your own damn head's just as good as mine, hell yes. The mob of men snickered and fussed among themselves and made motions with their hands like a baseball umpire saying, Out. They shuffled around on their feet and then broke out into little bunches and started to drift out of the yard, all talking. Above them, the big boy yelled back at me, You look out here, call him fool air, bud. Man, hey, listen, I know we all see the same thing, like a newsreel's in our mind. All the work that needs to be done, better highways, better buildings, better houses, everything needs to be fixed up better. But God damn it, I'm no mastermind. All I know is we got to get together and stick together. This country won't ever get any better as long as it's dog-eat-dog. -dog every man for his own self and to hell with the rest of the world we got to all get together damn it all and make somebody give us a job somewhere doing something but the whole crowd walked off down towards main street laughing and talking and throwing their hands i leaned back up against the side of a shack and watched the gravel dust cutting down the last of the hollyhocks news reels in my head i was looking and thinking to myself and i was thinking of old heavy going News reels in my head. By God, maybe we all got to learn how to see them news reels in our head. So with that, you get a glimpse of uh, why he was poor. Because he wouldn't, he could have been a leader of the people had he wanted to lead them to do what they wanted to do, which was not a positive thing. He wasn't giving them the easy answers they wanted to hear, and he wouldn't, make himself out to be better than they were. And you know, it's a funny, very quite curious thing I've found myself is that people sometimes want people to be superior to them. You say somebody has a gift because, they, you know, people go, oh, I wish I could do that, you know, but they don't want to necessarily deal with the truth that they could do it. 
and Woody would tell them the truth that they could. He did. He empowered people, but by telling them that they could do it, then they like, well, if I'm as good as you, then I, they disvalued him. So Woody was somewhat disvalued, but he's that's he had his chances for fame. Some of it was his decision, and that's what this next part is. It's called Crossroads. There are big old sweat standing on my forehead, and my fingers didn't feel like they was mine. I was floating in high finances, 65 stories above the ground, leaning my elbow on a stiff-looking tablecloth as white as a runway ghost and tapping my finger on the side of a big fish bowl. The bowl was full of clear water with bright red rose, white as your hand sunk down in the water, which made the rose look bigger and redder and the leaves greener than they were. But everything else in the room looked this way when you looked through the rose bowls of water on the other 25 and 30 tables. Each row of tables was in a horseshoe curve, and each curve a little higher than the one below. I was at the lowest. The price of the table for the night was $25. 65 stories back to the world. Quite a little elevator ride down to where the human race was being run. The name of the place? The Rainbow Room, in a city called New York, in the building called Rockefeller Center, where the shrimps are boiled in standard oil, and I was waiting to take an audition to see about getting a job sitting there. Classiest joint I'd ever seen. I'd looked all around at the deep rugs like a grassy lawn, and wavy drapes bellied back from the windows, and I laughed to myself, and I heard other performers crack jokes at the whole works. This must be the Raven Ward, the way they got things all padded up. A sissy-looking little man in a long tailcoat was waiting for his time to try out. I just don't think they moved the upholstery yet this year, some lady with an accordion folded across her lap was whispering, and them tables almost laughed, saying, It's just like this here building. Higher up you get, the colder it gets. The man that had been our guide and got us up there in the first place walked across the rug with his nose in the air like a trained seal, grinned up at us waiting to take our tryouts and said, Shh, quiet, everybody. Everybody slumped down and straightened up and sat tight and got awful quiet while three or four men and a lady or two, dressed to match the fixtures, walked in through the high arch door, the main terrace, and took seats at one end of the table. Main boss, I said behind the back of my hands to the others at the table. Head shook up and down, yes. I noticed that everybody put on a different face, like wax people almost, tilting their heads in the breeze, grinning in the late afternoon sun that fell across the floor, and smiling like they'd never missed a meal. This look is the look the most show folks learn pretty early in the game. They paint it on their faces, or sort of mold it on, so they can always smile like a monkey through his bars. So nobody will know that their rent ain't paid up yet, or they ain't had no job this season, and that they just finished a sensational whirlwind run of five flops in a row. The performers looked like the rich customers shining in the sun, and the head boss with his table full of middle-sized bosses looked like they'd been shot at and missed. Through the water and the rose bowls, everything in the place had an upside-down look. The floor looked like the ceiling, and the halls looked like the walls, and the hungry looked like they was rich, and the rich looked like they was hungry. Finally, somebody must have made a motion or give a signal because a girl in a gunny sack dress got up and sung a song that was told how she was already going on 13 and was getting pretty hot under the collar, tired of waiting, and afraid of being an old maid and wanting to be a hillbilly bride. Head shook up and down, and the big boss and the middle-sized bosses and the agents and the handlers smiled across the empty tables. I heard somebody whisper, she's hired. Next, Woody Guthrie, a snazzy-looking gent, was saying over the mic, Reckon that's me. I was mumbling under my chin, talking to myself, and looking out the window, thinking. I reached in my pocket and spun a thin dime across the tablecloth, and watched it whirl around and around, first heads, then tails, and said to myself, some difference between that there apricot orchard last June, where folks was stuck down on the river bottom, and this here rainbow room on an August afternoon. Gosh, I've come a long ways in the last few months. I ain't made no money to speak of, but I stuck my head in a lot of plain and fancy places, some good, some just barely fair, and some awful bad. I wrote up a lot of songs for union folks, send them everywhere, wherever folks got together, and talked in some, 
from Madison Square Garden, the Cuban Cigar Makers Taverns, the Spanish Harlem, an hour later, in the padded studios of CBS and NBC to the wild backcountry in the raggedy ghetto. In some places, I was put on display as a freak. In others, I was a hero. In the tough joints around Battery Park, I was just another shadow blundering around like the rest. It had been like this here, a little old dime spinning, a whirl of heads and tails. I liked mostly the union workers and the soldiers and the men in fighting clothes, shooting clothes, shipping clothes, farming clothes, because singing with them made me friends with them, and I felt like I was somehow in on their work. But this coin spinning, that was my last dime, and this rainbow room, well, rumors are it pays as much as $75 a week. And 75 a week is damn sure 75 a week. Woody Guthrie. Coming. I walked up to the microphone, gulping, trying to think of something to sing about. I was a little blank in the head or something, and no matter how damn hard I tried, I just couldn't think up any kind of a song to sing. I was just empty. What will be your first selection, Mr. Guthrie? Uh, a little tune, I guess, called uh, New York City. And so I forked the announcer and out of the way in the wiry end of my guitar handle, and made up these words as a sum. Another rainbow room, she's mighty fine. You can spit from here to the Texas line, New York City, or New York City. It's New York City. I really got to know my line. This rainbow room is up so high that John D. Spirit comes drifting by. This is in New York City. She's New York City, and I'm in New York City, and I really got to know my line. New York towns on a big, big room. Got me sitting in the rainbow room. That's New York City. That's New York City. She's old New York City where I really got to know my line. I took the tune to church. I took it holy roller. Shot in a few split notes. Oozed in a fake one. Come down to the barrel house. Hit off a good old country lonesome note or two. Trying to get that old guitar to help me. To talk with me. To talk for me. And say what I was thinking just this one time. Well, this rainbow room's a funny place. It's a long way from here to the USA and back to New York City. God, New York City. New York City, where I really got to know my line. The microphone man come running up and waved me to stop, asking, hmm, where does this particular song end, sir? And I looked over at him, and I was just getting strung out. Good, mister. The number is most amusing, exciting, and extremely colorful, but I'm wondering if it would be suited for our customers. <laughs> To our customers, just a couple questions. How do you get it out to the microphone and back again? Well, walk is a rule. Well, that won't do. Let's see you trot in through the arch doorway there. Sidestep when you come to the flat platform. Prance pretty lively when you go down those three stairs. And then sprint up to the microphone on the balls of your feet, throwing your weight on the joints of your ankles. And before I could say anything, he'd run and trot it back, show me exactly what he was talking about. Another one of those bosses from the table at the back wall yelled, as far as his interest is concerned, I think we can rehearse it for a week or two and get it ironed out. Yes, of course, his microphoning has got to be tested and the lights adjusted to his size. But that can be done later. I'm thinking about his makeup. What kind of makeup do you use, young man? Another boss was talking from his table. Well, I ain't been using none. I talked in the mic. I felt the far away rattling and rumbling of freight trains and transfer trucks calling to me. I bit my tongue and listened. Under the lights, you know, your natural skin would look too pale and too dead. You wouldn't mind putting on some kind of makeup just to liven yourself up, would you? No, I don't suppose. Why was I thinking one thing in my head and saying something different with my mouth? Fine, the lady nodded from her head from the boss's table. Now, oh yes, what kind of costume shall I get for him? What? I said, but nobody heard me. She folded her hands together under her chin and clicked. Her wax eyelashes together like loose shingles in the high wind. I can just imagine a hay wagon piled high with singing field hands and this carefree character falling along in the dust behind the wagon, singing after a day's work is done. That's it. French peasant garb. Oh, no, wait, wait. I see him as a Louisiana swamp dweller, half asleep on the flat top of a gum stump, his feet dangling in the mud and his gun leaning near his head. Ah, oh, what a follow-up with a gunny sack girl singing Hillbilly Bride. A man losing a wrestling match with a four-bit cigar, arguing with the lady. I have it. Listen, I have it. The lady rose up from her table, and the look on her face like she was in a trance of some kind. She walked over across the carpet to where I was standing, saying, I have it. Perio. 
We shall dress him in Perry Row costumes. One of those darling clown suits. It will bring out the life and the pep of this giddy humor of his, period. Isn't that simply swell idea? She folded her hands under her chin again and swayed over against my shoulder as I sidestepped to miss her. Imagine what a proper costume will bring out in these people. Their carefree life, open skies, their quaint simplicity. Pero, pero. She was dragging me across the floor by the arm, and we left the room with everybody talking at once. Some taking tryouts said, gosh, darn it. Well, on the outside on the high glass porch of some kind where wild tangled green things grew all along the floor by the window, she shoved me down in a leather chair by a plastic table inside and puffed like she'd done an honest day's work. Now, let me see. Oh, yes. My impression of the slight sample of your work is a bit, so to say, incomplete. That is, as far as the cultural traditions represented in the exchange of interrelationships and the overlapping of these same cultural patterns are concerned, especially here in America, where we have, well, you know, such a mixing bowl of cultures, such a stew pot of shades and colors. But nevertheless, I think the clown costume will represent a large portion of the humorous spirit of all of them, and I let my ears bend away from her talking, and I let my eyes drift out the window down 65 stories, where the town of old New York was standing up and living and breathing and cussing and lapping down yonder across that long island. I began to pace back and forth, keeping my gaze out the window, way down, watching the diapers and underwear blow from the fire escapes and clotheslines on the back side of the buildings, seeing the smoke whip itself into a hazy blur that smeared across the sky and mixed with all of the other smoke that tried to hide the town. Limp papers whipped and beat upwards, rose into the air and fell head over heels, curving over backwards and sideways and over and over. Loose sheets of newspaper with pictures of people and stories of people printed somewhere on them, turning loops in the air, and it was a blow. Blow, little paper, blow. Twist and turn and stay up as long as you can. And when you come down, come down on a penthouse porch. Come down easy so not to hurt yourself. Come down and lay there in the rain and the wind and the suit and the smoke and that grit that gets in your eyes in the big city. And lay there in the sun and get faded and rotten, but keep on trying to tell your message, and keep on trying to be a picture of a man, because without that story, and without that message printed on you there, you wouldn't be much. Remember, it's just maybe, someday, sometime, somebody will pick you up and look at your picture and read your message, and carry you in his pocket, and lay you on a shelf, and then burn you in a stove, but he'll have your message in his head, and he'll talk it, and it'll get all around, I'm blowing just as wild and whirling as you are. And lots of times I've been picked up, third down, picked up, but my eyes have been my camera taking pictures of the world. And my songs have been messages that I tried to scatter across the black si the back sides all along the steps and the fire escapes on the window sills and all through the dark halls. Still going like 1910 talking machine, my lady friend has said a whole raft of stuff that I've not heard a single word of. I'm afraid my ears have been running somewhere down along the streets, I heard her say. So the interest manifest by the manager is not at all a personal thing. Not at all, not at all, not at all. But there is another reason why you are so certain to satisfy the desires of our customers. And I always say, don't you always say? What the customer says is what we all ought to say. Her teeth shined and her eyes snapped different colors. Don't you? Don't I what? Oh, excuse me just a minute. Huh? I'll be right back. I took one good look, long down, down, down the red leather seats and the plastic tables and the glass in room, and I grabbed my guitar by the neck, and I said to a boy in uniform, where's the restroom? And I followed where he pointed, except when I got within a few feet of the sign that said men, I took a quick dodge down a little hallway that said elevator. The lady shook her head and nodded with her back turned to me, and I asked the elevator man, going down? Okay, ground floor. Quickest way is too slow. So Woody did have shots at the big time, but it was, uh, he would have been doing a parody of who he was because he was an honest person. And, you know, it, the book was called Bound for Glory for a reason because he knew where he was bound for. Uh, he knew that his legacy was the type that doesn't die off. And even there at that Brooklyn State Hospital, a uh, whole new group of young people started coming to visit him there and they ended up 
playing uh, folk music in Greenwich Village, and that was the really the birth of the folk revival with Bob Dylan and Joan Baez and all sorts of people. So Woody Guthrie lives on and on and on. Have a nice day.